Father in heaven, we thank you so much for an opportunity to once again look at this topic of overcoming the lusts of the eyes, the lusts of the flesh. We thank you so much that you have a victory plan, uh, but also that you diagnose our condition accurately, that you convict and, and point out our areas of needed growth. And so I do pray for every soul viewing this and for those who are, who are not, that we could reach out to with this information. And I pray, Lord, that you would inspire and that you would do the speaking and, and lead us along your path to life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is session two of the Faith Over the Flesh seminar. And in this session, I am very excited to present some things that perhaps you may have never heard before. But the first thing I want to show is right out of the Ten Commandments. This I'm sure you have heard before. In the Ten Commandments, there's a statement that skeptics have really uh, made, a, made a big deal out of. And, and upon first glance, when you read that, it, it is puzzling. And you wonder, what, is this, what does this really mean? Well, the skeptics just look at this and they say, this is an unjust God because it says that I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And, and people are going, well, how is that just and right for the children to suffer for what the fathers have done? Well, actually, if you look deeper in the Bible, you find there were laws in the Old Testament Israel that you were not allowed to punish children for the sins of their fathers. Ezekiel 18 underscores this same concept. And so biblically, that is not just to punish the children for the sins of the fathers. So what does this statement mean in the Ten Commandments? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, it mentions to the third and fourth generations. Interesting. Well, a new scientific field called epigenetics really gives us some perspective on what this means. The epigenetic studies have shown that your genes are not fixed. In other words, you are not born with a genetic destiny that determines who you are and your choices and your struggles for the rest of your life. No, your genes are the way they are. The DNA is the way it is, but there are instructions above the genes that will turn on and turn off various genes so that they express in different ways. And you know, you can turn on and turn off different genes by changing your, di your diet, having different behaviors, different thoughts. Basically, anything you do in your lifestyle will change gene expression and so that you step forward a different person. So that's quite an encouraging and positive scientific reality. But the really amazing thing about epigenetics is this. These changes in your gene expression do not only affect you, but they are passed on to your children, to your grandchildren, and to your great-grandchildren. Count the number of generations. To the third and fourth generation, you, your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Now, there was a book published over 100 years ago for, of writings from over 100 years ago, and the book is called Child Guidance. Now, this book had some comments in it that people really made fun of. They look at that, oh, this is so ridiculous, these 19th century moralists and their comments about sexuality. This book made the claim that children, boys, will receive from their fathers a propensity to engage in masturbation. And people said, oh, that's silly 19th century non-scientific nonsense. Well, now those folks and those skeptics have been proven wrong. Because epigenetics shows that the decisions we make, the character we form, who we are in any respect is passed along to our children. Now, of course, they can make subsequent changes as well, so this doesn't mean that it's fixed in their destiny, but it is, I find it quite humorous that it took us 3,500 years to catch up with the insights from the Ten Commandments. This is not an unjust God punishing arbitrarily the children. It is us making decisions, and our sins are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. That's amazing. Now, speaking of this topic, I was sitting in an actual Christian school classroom listening to a teacher tell the students that... As middle schoolers, you guys are maturing and you're going through these changes. Many of you are probably practicing masturbation, and that's okay, the teacher said. And this is appropriate and healthy and normal, and you should feel comfortable doing so. She encouraged them to do so. Now, I hope to show in this session that self-abuse, as it's called, and pornography is not harmless. It causes tremendous harm. And we looked last time at the lust cascade, the steps in the brain where you go down this pathway of lust and you go down this pathway of unholiness, what happens in the brain and how you got there. But what we didn't show in session one was the effects of the lust cascade. The effects are, first of all, you remember the amygdala were activated. These are the fear and anxiety centers of the brain. When the amygdala are, are chronically and habitually activated, you actually have a situation where it is impairing 
the conscience and altruism circuits, which is the anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate cortex is at the back of the frontal lobe, and that's where you have the, the, the sense of right and wrong, the, the conscience, or altruism, doing good for others even though you get no benefit. The, the anterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala are kind of like a teeter-totter. When one is up, the other is down. When the other is up, the other is down. So when altruism and conscience is engaged, then fear is kind of set aside. Or how about as 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out all fear. We now know that that biblical statement is a neurologically accurate scientific statement. But flip that around also. Fear is going to cast out love. So if we are having amygdala agitation, if the amygdala is firing off habitually and chronically, whether it's through fear, anxiety, and daily life, or whether it's through sexual desires and continual lust, guess what we're not able to have? A healthy anterior cingulate cortex. We aren't able to experience healthy altruism and conscience. 1 Timothy 4.2 refers to those who have had their consciences seared as with a hot iron. And this is what we're doing when we do this over and over again. We're searing that anterior cingulate cortex, weakening it, making it less sensitive to right and wrong. Another effect of the lust cascade is that the higher cortex is left out of the equation every time you go down that pathway. And so when the higher cortex is left out, it's going to be weaker. You're going to have increased impulsivity, loss of self-control, and more self-centeredness coming in, neurologically speaking. So the, in other words, the character is damaged further and further. Also, a third effect of the lust cascade is the natural route to pleasure through the prefrontal cortex. It, it is, that is decoupled. The prefrontal cortex is no longer the preferred route to gain pleasure. In other words, when you engage in a new discovery, you work really hard at something that's compelling and interesting to you. You, you, you use self-discipline to go for a jog, and then you get the pleasure of the runner's high, or you get the pleasure of discovering something. You do an altruistic activity to do, do good for others, and you feel good. Those pleasures are normal, natural, healthy, and holy. But when we directly target the pleasure centers of the brain over and over again through the lusts of the flesh, then that way, that route to pleasure is decoupled and it just becomes uh, not a part of our life anymore. God's way for pleasure is no longer enjoyable to the addict, which is very sad. It's kind of like if you eat a bowl of ice cream and then you try to eat a raw carrot. Right? The raw carrot doesn't taste very good anymore because you've ruined your brain's pleasure receptors. This image that you saw last time, you've seen the muted or the numbed down pleasure response in the brain for a drug abuser. It's the same thing with a pornography addict. Well, another effect of the lust cascade is that the sexual experience releases endorphins and keflins and opiates at four times the rate of morphine. So the brain has this hugely intense, intense pleasure experience that we mentioned last time. And remember that, th that these initial arousers are burned into the brain to be called up at a later time, which strengthens the pathway for addiction. And then, due to this intense pleasure reward at the end of the experience, this whole process, seeing the image, the survival drive being set into motion, dwelling upon the image, heightened amygdala tension, this lust cascade we talked about last time, and then the release of the amygdala tension, combined with a dopamine rush and reward circuit firing. This whole process becomes a pattern that the brain demands happen again and again, to the point where you get to this. Even some who profess to be looking for his appearing are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself. They are not cleansing themselves from all pollution. They have so long served their lust that it is natural for their thoughts to be impure and their imaginations corrupt. It is as impossible to cause their minds to dwell upon pure and holy things as it would be to turn the course of Niagara and send its waters pouring up the falls. Now that's a reality. In my own strength, this is impossible. As impossible as, as turning around the Niagara Falls. But with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So don't be left without hope, brothers and sisters. There, the, the, not just the, the science, but especially the Bible is presenting a shockingly high level of hope to the pornography addict. So what happens to these holiness pathways, though? The sensitive nerves of the brain have lost their healthy tone by morbid excitation to gratify an unnatural desire for sensual indulgence. Now, this statement about the ner sensitive nerves of the brain losing their healthy tone is also neurologically accurate based upon our understanding today. What you see on the screen is an actual neur neuron with the nerve fibers and the axons and dendrites. 
And w- w- the way that you actually reroute a thought is, you remember all those different axons and dendrites connecting to other neurons? This represents the thousands of possible connections that a, a single neuron can have with other neurons in order to form this vast network and these 40 quadrillion possible different connections. Well, those are going to lose their tone, as we just heard. The connections for holiness starts to, starts to shrivel up. It starts to, it's, it's morbid excitation is going to cause it to lose its healthy tone. So those pathways, those connections start to fail. And the pathways for lust and, and licentiousness begin to strengthen. And that's a sad reality. But the good news is, we don't stop this by just stopping. We stop this by having a whole new structure, a renewed experience, as we talked about last time. And the overcoming of this, this, again, three hours of material just on the overcoming, is is really going to say, where do we go from here? How do I bounce into something more holy and, and use the devil coming at me like this as a judo move for really just backfiring on him? Forgive the judo analogy, but you understand. Use his momentum against him. Now, this issue of pornography, I mentioned that it's very harmful, but it's not just harm, harming yourself. Revelation 18 describes a last day's satanic Babylon system. And this system is engaging in economic trade. And one of the things mentioned in the merchants of Babylon and their economic trade is that they actually exchange in the bodies and souls of men. Now, this means human beings. The bodies and souls of human beings are reduced to an economic commodity. That's exactly what's happening in our day today. You've heard the phrase sex sells. And in fact, sexual allurement allurement is the strongest force in the economy today. And the pornography industry itself obviously is selling the bodies of men and women. And so you might say, well, I'm not paying for it. You know, I don't go and rent these things and, 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 and buy them to download them. I've just viewed it from, from, you know, from time to time. It's not a big problem for me, but I'm not really supporting the industry. Not so. Every page visit on a sexual website translate to more advertising power for that website and more dollars going into that industry. So pornography viewers are funding the industry, even if no money ever leaves their bank account. And this industry is not an industry that healthy young ladies walk into as whole and and spiritually healthy and emotionally properly functioning people. We have a lot of hurting people in this industry. Countless lives are being destroyed by pornography use. Not just the use, but being a part of the industry. And you you don't enter that industry as as a healthy, psychologically and emotionally whole person. Usually there's some sort of substance abuse or history of sexual abuse, some sort of psychological brokenness or or poverty. And and the pornography user, whether they know it or not, they are preying upon her and them when when he is consuming. If you ever think about the the phrases we use, we talk about pornography material. We, we, We say consumers of pornography. We say pornography users. And aren't those apt terms? A user. You're using somebody. Material. They've been reduced to mere material, not the human image bearer of God that they are. Pornography user, pornography material. And the the kind of terminology that we use really illustrates what is going on. Now, something else that happens when you engage in this pornographic behavior has to do with oxytocin and vasopressin. These are the trust and love and bonding hormones. These are the hormones that are released when a mother breastfeeds her baby and bonds with that baby at an emotional level. Oxytocin and vasopressin are released. Also, when when a woman gives birth to a baby, these hormones are released in, in enormous quantities. And it really helps explain why a woman would go through that experience of pain again. It's the most insane and intense and painful experience. Well, all this oxytocin and vasopressin has just flooded her system. And so the thought of doing that again isn't so unthinkable. (laughs) Uh, But also, oxytocin and vasopressin are released in large quantities in response to orgasm. This explains why a woman in an abusive relationship will many times, and and there are other factors as well, but this is one of them, she's bonded to him emotionally, psychologically, through the oxytocin and vasopressin. And so even if the relationship is completely destructive, this situation is, is, is hard to pull apart from for other reasons as well, as well, but oxytocin and vasopressin play a part in that. And you know, these hormones are another reason why premarital sexual relationships are so foolish. Why it would be so just irresponsible to bond with somebody before marriage in this way, because you're not going to think objectively about them now. Now that you've engaged in any sort of sexual behavior with them, 
You are now, you've had these, these, these experiences, this sexual release and this, this oxytocin release, and all of a sudden, oh, you feel in love, but actually, you're not evaluating that person objectively and honestly. And then if that relationship ends, oh, it's so much more painful, oh, I'm so depressed, and then I, you jump into another relationship because you've become accustomed to this need, you've become dependent, and that you don't have the time for the brain to reset and really think objectively about your life. But the most important component of oxytocin and vasopressin is that God gave us these, these hormones in sex so that men and women will be, will be drawn to each other, so that we will want to continually return to each other. The, the, the experiences are, are, are burned into our memory so that we have that desire to remain faithful. But with pornography, you're actually creating a bond with women all over the internet, all over the world. This bond that was intended to be the, to, to, to image and picture God's exclusive love for his people and our exclusive devotion for God is now a counterfeit, in counterfeit bonds all over the place with all these people. And these areas of the brain, by the way, don't know the difference between that real bond and the counterfeit one. It's releasing this stuff no matter what. And this is why Jesus said, when you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery because you've actually bonded with her in a very real way. What does this do to marriage for married men who are engaged in this? Well, it really essentially destroys intimacy in marriage. And the reason for this is because these pornographic experiences are so intense, so pleasurable. Just like a drug, the drug targets those opiate receptors in the brain and woo, you get that high, you get that feeling, and it's hyperactivated, and they become numbed. And so you need more shocking, more intense levels of the drug, or in this case, the pornography, in order to get the same feeling. Well, the normal sexual experiences don't cut it anymore. Because it's not like it is over here in the fantasy world, in the unreal world of pornography. And so intimacy in marriage is destroyed because the bonds are being created all over here. The, the opiate receptors are being numbed and marriages are being destroyed with this issue. The man doesn't enjoy the wife of his youth any longer. It's very tragic. But single people sometimes have the thought, okay, I'm struggling now, this is really hard, but once I get married, all of this lust stuff, this problem will go away and I will be okay and I will be able to have self-control again. Ask the millions of men, married men, who are struggling with pornography addiction and lust. Ask them if getting married in itself solved their lust problem, gave them self-control over the, over the eyes and over the thoughts. It just does not happen. That is an illusion that many single young men are thinking about. Getting married will not heal your brokenness, will not give you self-control in any sort of way. But there was one study where researchers expose subjects to pornography almost every day over only six weeks. And I want to say about this study, this is a terribly immoral study. Obviously, we don't support and endorse people doing studies like this. But since they've done it, here's what they found. The, the subjects were far less satisfied with their marital sexual relationship. So everything that I've just shared about intimacy being destroyed in marriage actually bears out in the studies. When you are subjected to pornography, marital sexual relationships are very un satisfying. Another study found that after viewing only 26 sexually alluring slides and one six-minute video, subjects were less attracted to their wives. So these are no surprise that these studies are bearing these things out. But many men say things like, you know, I have needs. It is true that you have needs. In order to live, you have to eat and drink. And the sexual desire, even though it's sexually acting out, is not a need. The sexual desire itself does reflect an actual need, though. Because you have a need for intimacy. True connection with another person or with God. It doesn't need to be sexual intimacy. Just intimacy. You can have that with children. You can have that with friends. You can have that with family. A relationship of openness and oneness. Marriage, of course, is the most beautiful and close picture of oneness. But God gave us the sexual desire to drive us into intimacy with our spouse. And he also gave us marriage and sex as a picture and a reminder of the even greater intimacy of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about when you become one flesh with a woman in sexual intimacy. It also refers to being one spirit with God. So this is a picture of that. Ephesians 5 says that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. So your need, you say, I have needs, but your need is not sex. Your need is intimacy. There is nothing about human biology, neurology, that would define sexually acting out as a need. You won't die. <laughs> Jesus went 33 years perfectly sexually pure. You do have that need of intimacy, though, and that will be fulfilled only in Jesus Christ and the people he has given you. It doesn't need to be sexual. 
You satisfy the desire of every living thing. God would never give you a desire that can't be fulfilled. We might have debased desires that we've fostered for ourselves, and so we feel that we need this experience, but God is satisfying our every true desire, our every God-born and God-birthed desire within us. But if you try and satisfy your own desires, listen to um, William Struthers in Wired for Intimacy. He explains that masturbation is playing with neurochemical fire. It affects one emotionally and neurologically. So this could be the porn user or the non-porn user. Engaging this in, in this behavior is playing with neurochemical fire. It affects you emotionally and neurologically. The sexual wiring within the brain is not something you can just turn on and turn off. This behavior of self-sex, if you will, it's conditioning the brain to experience sexuality in a certain way. And you're going to take that baggage with you into the marriage bed if you're a single person or even as a married person engaging in that. Now, what do the studies show? Masturbation has been shown in studies to produce, in some cases, impotence, inability to climax, premature ejaculation, the need to play out the images so often seen or imagined in the past. Basically, it produces a very unhealthy marriage bed. But as the people of God, we've known about this. There were some very frank discussions and comments in the 19th century by our pioneers in a book called A Solemn Appeal relative to solitary vice and the abuses and excesses of the marriage relation. And you might say in the 19th century, this was the Victorian age. They just didn't talk about it. And I know many people listening to me talk about it. They might feel uncomfortable. But the, the, the candor and the frankness that these people were willing to talk about this issue, it's, it's, it's really amazing given the time that they lived in. And so over the years, you know, the 20th century historian looked back on this book and, and writings like this in Child Guidance and other places and they made fun of this. They said, really, come on, that's a joke. They, they recommended uh, self-abuse as a, as a healthy and positive thing. Well, it's time to catch up with the insights of 150 years ago. I'm going to share a list with you now. Of I just compiled all of the different effects of this behavior as listed in Spirit of Prophecy writings. And what we read is, the effects of self-abuse in the 19th century, these claims were made. That you would experience pain in the shoulder, side and back. Great exhaustion after exercising or lack of strength or endurance. Some or all of these. A deficiency in the mental strength, absent-mindedness, daydreaming and inattention, forgetfulness and a weak memory, a weakened brain, a lack of perseverance and a reluctance to engage in active labor, a gloomy sadness upon the countenance, frequent exhibitions of a morose temper in those who were once cheerful, kind and affectionate, disposed to look upon the dark side, a loss of appetite, poor sleep, tired feelings in the morning, damage to the nervous system, easily irritated and nervousness, decay of the skull, the lack of healthful beauty, the sallow face, the progress of disease upon them, cancerous tumors, inflamed mucous membranes, in other words, the common cold, rheumatism, weakened eyesight, dropsy, or what we would call edema. Now, even now, you're probably looking at this going, really? Uh, masturbation is going to cause all of those things. These, these claims seem, seem like a stretch. The first time I heard them, I thought that. Well, let's take a look at what the modern science says today. We're going to start with a couple of studies that were done by Cooper and Carnes. They found that masturbating as little as two times per week has been shown to increase depression, memory problems, lack of focus, concentration problems, fatigue, back pain, pelvic or testicular pain. Is some of this starting to sound familiar? Uh, we're going to compare the modern science and that list. Again, we're going to circle back around and look at it, but let's look at some more of the modern science. Zinc is a very important element. It aids in the formation of bone and prevention of bone breakdown. It aids in immunity. It's the first line of defense in the skin and the mucous membranes, and it helps activate immune cells. It also leads to normal growth, growth to fighting infections and healing wounds, and combating disease as a component of antioxidants. Zinc is also used for diaper rash, to reduce ADHD, to improve skin health, treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, treatment for macular degeneration, used by the liver to help bind toxins for removal, used for eye health, used for skin health, used to boost mood, used to boost brain health. Now, what does this have to do with this issue? Well, zinc, 10 milligrams per day is what you need, and one ejaculation can dispose of five milligrams of zinc. Or according to MD, PhD, David Horobin, the amount of zinc in semen is such that one ejaculation may get rid of all the zinc that can be absorbed from the intestines in one day. Repeated ejaculation may lead to a real zinc deficiency with various problems developing. And so that's what the science is telling us. Also, studies have shown that zinc deficiency is connected with worse dim in the environment, with poor immunity, 
with white spots on the nails, which is something that pornography users report frequently, and, of course, dry skin and acne. One last statement from Richard Nye's PhD in clinical psychology, he stated that masturbation breaks down the finer sensitivities of our nervous system. It is not difficult to see in terms of the electrical mediation of our nervous system how disease becomes a natural result of individuals who have placed their own gratification at the center of their being. Disease is a natural result of this. Okay, so that's what all of the science is telling us. Let's, let's, let's organize and categorize this now and go back to that list of two columns of all of the supposed claims from the 19th century where, where people laughed at this. And let's take it one by one. Let's take this section first, the red ones. Remember this? Pain in the shoulders, side and back from Spirit of Prophecy. Great exhaustion after exercising, lack of strength or endurance, a deficiency in the mental strength, absent-minded, daydreaming and inattention, forgetfulness and weak memory and weakened brain. Doesn't this sound an awful lot like Cooper and Carnes' research? They found memory plot problems, lack of focus, concentration problems, fatigue, back pain, and pelvic or testicular pain. So it's all measuring up so far. Every single one of these claims that were laughed at are being now sustained by the modern research. Let's go on to the next. You see the ones highlighted in blue. A lack of perseverance and a reluctance to engage in active labor gloomy sadness upon the countenance, frequent exhibitions of a morose temper in those who were once cheerful, kind, and affectionate, disposed to look upon the dark side, loss of appetite, poor sleep, and tired feelings in the morning. If you look at each one of these carefully, every one of those is a symptom of depression. And Cooper and Carnes also found depression to be correlated with masturbation. So, so far all of the claims have added up and, and been confirmed by modern science. The next ones, you can know anecdotally, damage to the nervous system and easily irritated nervousness. I've looked at some of the online discussion forums and web pages of pornography recovery people, and they talk about how, they, how, they, how their tremors have stopped. Like, I didn't even realize people were having tremors because of this. And others, want, others say, you know what, I used to have so much irritation and nervousness, and now that has subsided, now that I've come off of this stuff. So, just like we see in the claims here from the 19th century. Now, the last section, purple. Decay of the skull. These ones were a little bit harder to swallow. The lack of, of healthful beauty, the sallow face, the progress of disease upon them, cancerous tumors, inflamed mucous membranes, such as the common cold, rheumatism, weakened eyesight, and dropsy. Now, these are the ones that people really laughed at. Like, really, you're going to go blind? Ha, ha, ha. Or your skull's going to shrink. And, you know, people just made jokes about this as if this was not something that was deadly serious. Well, guess what? Every one of those ones that you just saw, highlighted in purple, is a symptom of zinc deficiency. Or solving it is something that zinc helps solve. Let's go through them one at a time. The first one, decay of the skull. Remember that zinc is necessary for the formation of bone and the prevention of bone breakdown and for normal growth. So if we don't have enough zinc in the body, if you're engaging in behaviors that release enormous amounts of zinc and you're, you're zinc deficient, well, you won't have bone growth properly. So a child's bones may not be developing as it should because of zinc deficiency. Secondly, the lack of healthful beauty and the sallow face. Well, remember that zinc deficiency also causes dry skin and is used to improve skin health, is used in the treatment of diaper rash. So again, zinc deficiency is, is causing these things. Having more zinc would be helping these things. And so the reason you see people who have zinc deficiency have, have these things, the this, this studies are bearing that out. The progress of disease and cancerous tumors. This was a tough one for people to believe, but look at this. Zinc aids in immunity, in fighting infections and healing wounds and in combating disease as a component of antioxidants. Remember what Dr. Richard Nye said, disease is the natural result of this. Now this doesn't mean that every single person engaged in this behavior is going to have all of these effects, but these are a list of the possible results for this behavior. Let's look at the next one. Inflamed mucous membranes of the common cold. Well, zinc is essential in immunity. It's the first line of defense in the skin and the mucous membranes. Helps activate immune cells, fights infections, and it's used by the liver to help bind toxins for removal. Next one, rheumatism. Zinc is used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Weakened eyesight. Zinc is used in the treatment of macular degeneration. And Zinc deficiency causes worse vision in dim environments. Dropsy or edema is treated with zinc and other, and other nutrients. Now we also read here in 1 Peter 2 verse 11, something very important. It's a word, you know, people say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about this subject. It doesn't use the word. It doesn't talk about it specifically. But we do hear very strong statements and principles that obviously apply to this issue that we're discussing. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain 
from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. They war against the body. They war against the brain. They war against the soul. He who engages in this sexual behavior is, 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 is sinning against his own body, the Apostle Paul said. It is self-abuse. And Peter says, abstain from it. The Holy Spirit tells us, abstain, abstain, abstain from fleshly lusts. This is not something that can be done in moderation. This is not something that can be done occasionally. This is not a need, right? It is not a need at all. And the Bible says abstain completely. The violation of one of God's precepts does violence to your moral nature. And this is why Paul says, the people who engage in sexual perversion receive in themselves the due penalty of their perversion, right? And not only does God require you to control your thoughts, but also your passions and affections. Your salvation depends upon your governing yourself in these things. We also read solemn messages from heaven cannot forcibly impress the heart that is not fortified against the indulgence of this degrading vice. So if you want to hear the voice of God, if you want to hear the solemn messages from heaven to the brain, don't abuse the brain. Don't abuse the body. Don't engage in this degrading vice as we heard. Because solemn messages from heaven will not be heard if we're engaged in, in continual selfishness and self-pleasure. Will they sacrifice comeliness, health, intellect, and all hope of heaven? Everything worth possessing, here and the hereafter, to the demon passion? May God grant that it may be otherwise. Now, I believe that the Bible actually does very specifically talk about this issue. In Psalm 38, I'd never read Psalm 38 this way before, but as you read through Psalm 38 with me over the next few minutes, you tell me, do you think this is somebody who is struggling with this very issue we're talking about? In verse 2, the psalmist says, your arrows pierce me deeply and your hand presses me down. So he feels condemned by God. The, the, the pornography addict, for the most part, feels so much condemnation and they feel like God is pressing them down with arrows and really, though, and as he goes on in verse 3, he realizes it's not God. He says, there is no soundness in my flesh nor any health in my bones because of my sin. It is my sin. God is not a God that comes to condemn but to save. But look at the verse again. It says, there is no soundness in my flesh nor any health in my bones. Interesting. Isn't this what we were just talking about? His skin isn't right. His body, his bones aren't healthy. Let's see, let's see if there's more. He says, I am troubled and bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Does that sound like depression? He goes mourning all the day, day long. He's troubled and bowed down greatly. Verse 7, my loins are full of inflammation. Interesting. Some translations have this one say, my back or my side is filled with burning or searing pain. Doesn't that sound like something we've just been studying? Verse 8, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. So he recognizes the turmoil in his own heart and soul, his woundedness, that perhaps the reason he is so encaptured by this thing is, is some unresolved issues that God wants to heal in him. I am, I am severely broken. I have turmoil in my heart. Next, he says, my heart pants. My strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes... It also has gone from me. Interesting. His eyes, the light of his eyes has gone from him. His heart rate has gone up. Heart pants. His strength fails him. So he's got weakened, a weakened body and less, less, less you might say, energy or, or, or less physical vigor. Some of the studies that we've been seeing here. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague. So he's isolated in verse 11 here. I, I, I'm feeling pulled back into my own little world of isolation and depression here. Verse 12, those, who see, those also who seek my life lay snares for me and plan deception all day long. And that's the devil, of course, right? Ultimately, his ultimate enemy, laying a snare for him, planning a deception that you might get captured in this once again. Then he says, I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. So he doesn't come clean before God. He keeps this thing quiet. And this is why he says, I am like a man who does not hear in verse 14. He doesn't hear the voice of God speaking hope and healing into his life. And remember, you don't hear the solemn messages from heaven, those who are engaged in this degrading vice. Verse 15, he has a glimmer of hope. In you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. But then I am ready to fall. Verse 17, I'm a failure. I fail again. I fail again. 
I fail every time. He's just ready to fall. He knows it's only a matter of time before he does it again. He doesn't envision victory. He doesn't see the hope of God breathing into his soul and into his life. My sorrow is continually before me, he says. So here we go in continual depression. Now let's review. What does this sound like? Feeling of condemnation and shame. Skin abnormality. An unhealthy body and bones. Depression. A pain in his loins or back or side. A wounded heart and emotional pain. Increased heart rate. Fatigue or, or less physical energy. Weakened vision. Isolation. Snares all around to entrap, keeps it secret, doesn't hear a solution, has a glimmer of hope from God, but then that's followed by the feeling of sorrowful and failure in the future. Aren't you glad the psalm doesn't end there with a portrait of somebody struggling with a sexual problem that we've been discussing? The rest of the psalm is very hopeful. It says, things change for him. It says in verse 18, I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. So that's where he finally comes clean. He comes before God, declares his iniquity, confesses his sin. And he says, my enemies are vigorous. They are strong, but do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me. O Lord, my salvation. He turns to God, completely dependent. You've seen how I've failed. You've, I confess my sin before you and don't forsake me. You are my salvation. That is the picture of healing and hope. And I'll tell you, there's a whole hour on how to truly look and live in a greater lust. I, I, I took a whole hour, not even to talk about pornography and lust, but to talk about how to have a relationship with Jesus, how to truly walk with the Lord, how to be Enoch's in this last generation. That's what it's going to take for no matter what struggle we have, whether it's a pornography addiction or anything else. We need to learn to look and live because without looking, there will be no living. If we look away, we will die certainly in our sins. And on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan has every method to entrap us and, and bring our souls down to death. And there's only one solution. But the sad thing is, most people, I've, I've spoken with, with uh, counselors who, who counsel pastors. And pastors are feeling kind of like these guys, just tremendous shame. Oh, I just feel condemned. I feel worthless. I feel sh just so much shame building up. And I am not happy with, I can't even look. I can't even turn to God. These, these counselors tell me, they ask me, they ask the pastors or, or any Christian worker, or any person struggling with this, how's your devotional life going? I'm struggling there. Just, I just don't feel like I can really turn to God because I feel so down. I feel so, so like a failure. Like he couldn't possibly want to respond to me again. Ugh. Guilt and shame are something that just load people down and they carry this around. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is a good thing. God heaps a burden of guilt upon your conscience to convict and get you to say, yes, I've messed up. The, the anterior cingulate cortex says, yes, that's unhealthy. That's unholy. That's damaging. Don't do it. It's not glorifying to God. It's not blessing others. It's harming others. It's harming God. It's, it's messing up the great controversy. It's casting reproach upon your Savior. That anterior cingulate cortex is important for a momentary feeling of guilt. That is seeking for relief. God gives us, so that, gives us that as, a, as a, if you will, like touching your hand on a hot stove. It, ooh, don't do that. That's a good, important moment. But when you turn to Christ, it is relieved. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy, my, gen my burden is light. But we carry it around. All the guilt, all the shame builds up, builds up, builds up. And we walk around with, with, with shame, which is different than guilt. Guilt is a momentary, appropriate guilt is a momentary thing to be relieved. Shame is something that I am. It's my identity now. Guilt calls for the behavior to stop. Shame is something you just live with. It shouldn't be chronic. It should be momentary. There should be a process of healing to get relieved, to get released. In fact, if you are ruminating over your failures, you know what they found in the research? Ruminating over your failures actually passes the mind over the same neuro circuit of the failures, thus reinforcing it. So if you feel like flogging yourself with, I'm such a terrible sinner and I did this, you're thinking about the this again, aren't you? You're widening those circuits and you're making victory even more difficult. God wants to give you victory by freeing you from having to think about it so much and think about your failures. And here's how he's going to do it. I want you to hear this message deep down in your heart. You remember the story of the pool of Bethesda and the paralyzed man laying there, unable to do anything. All of a sudden, one day, Jesus walks up. He looks down at the man. The man looks up. Listen to this. 
from ministry of healing. A rather extended quotation, but hear this in your, in your spirit. By sin, we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied or paralyzed, just like that man laying there. Of course, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man, the paralyzed man, capable of walking. Many realize their helplessness. They are longing for that spiritual life which will bring them into harmony with God. And they are striving to obtain it, but in vain. In despair, they cry, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let those desponding, struggling ones look up. The Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe the Savior's word. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds the, both body and soul. Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. The sense of sin has poisoned the springs of life. But Christ said, but Christ says, I will take your sins. I will give you peace. I have bought you with my blood. You are mine. <laughs> my grace shall strengthen your weakened will. Your, your remorse for sin, I will remove. When temptations assail you, when care and perplexity surround you, when depressed and discouraged, you are ready to yield to despair, look to Jesus. And the darkness that encompasses you will be dispelled by the bright shining of his presence. When sin struggles for the mastery in your soul and burdens the conscience, look to the Savior. His grace is sufficient to subdue sin. Let your grateful heart, trembling with uncertainty, turn to him. Lay hold on the hope set before you. Christ waits to adopt you into his family. His strength will help your weakness. He will lead you step by step. Place your hand in his hand and let him guide you. Never feel that Christ is far away. He is always near. His loving presence surrounds you. Seek him as one who desires to be found of you. He desires you not only to touch his garments, but to walk with him in constant communion. And that is a lesson each one of us needs to learn. It's a lesson I need to learn. How do I walk in constant communion with him? I'll tell you, it'll be a whole lot easier when I see him as he is, as the Apostle John said. When I see that he is bending over me saying, wilt thou be made well? I did not come to condemn, but to save. When he says to the woman caught in adultery, who condemns you? Go and leave your life of sin. That's his message to each one of us. He doesn't come at us with heaping continual guilt and shame upon us. He gives us that reaction of guilt so that we can turn to him, but not carry it around. Don't carry it around anymore. He has bought that victory. He has accomplished it at the, Christ and at the cross, and Christ will give that victory to you. He said, the Holy Spirit will give you and make known to you what is mine. And what is his? His victory. Every step of the way, he has walked ahead of us, and he will give you the victory. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the promises and the hope. Thank you so much for even just the, the neuroscience that we have, which shows that we can reroute our thoughts, that we can have victory and have a totally new brain. And the spiritual promises and confirmations in the scriptures that you will give us a renewed mind, a transformed mind. This is such hope, Lord. And I know that there are many who, who have lost a sense of hope and they've walked with so much discouragement. But I pray that you would give them that encouragement that they need and give those others that conviction that they need. Lord, we just pray for each soul to hear from you what needs to be heard. And I pray that you would give them the desires of their hearts. Give us a redeemed and purified desire and imagination. May our thoughts dwell more upon heavenly things, that we may, we may be the Enoch, the John the Baptist, the Elijah of this last generation. Lord, we need you. We need to look and live. We cannot do this in our own strength. And so I pray once again for every individual struggling in any way with any master passion that they would gain the victory before probation's hour closes. In Jesus' name, amen.